It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Beverly Hunt OBE, who's founder and medical director of Thrombosis UK. Thank you so much for joining us today, Beverly. And again, we're returning to a very topical subject. It's been with us for now over 12 months, COVID. But I'm sure like yourself and hospitals across the UK, we are being inundated with questions. So I'm hoping today to be able to ask you some of the questions we receive in particular around the COVID-19 vaccines and the um, VIT or the new syndrome that is being discussed in, on the media, in the media. In December, the first COVID-19 vaccine began to be rolled out in the UK, which was great news. And then soon there were options, Pfizer and the Oxford AstraZeneca. How do the vaccines differ when people are going along to receive them? It, it's really the way that they're made. So the, uh, the Pfizer and the Moderna, which we're now using, uh, are using a technique where um, they actually multiply in your body because they have got messenger RNA as part of their uh, vaccine. They're, they're, it's a very new way of doing vaccinations. So the AstraZeneca vaccine is old fashioned because it be, it's being made in the way that old vaccines would be made, which is there is part of the virus, the spike protein actually in the vaccine uh, and people make antibodies to it. Thank you. Now, since March, there's been an increased concern about the safety of, in particular, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and what is a rare syndrome called FIT being um, reported and recognised? Could you explain what is VIT? Yeah, so uh, it's a terminology that's evolved since we realised that some people very, very rarely, and we're talking about one in somewhere between one in 10,000 to one in 100,000 people, after the AstraZeneca vaccine were having blood clots and they had a low platelet count. And in the UK, I think we all became very aware of the issue across the UK at the same time. And all of the experts in thrombosis got together uh, and we have formed a group called the Expert Hematology Group and every day we have a meeting and if somebody has a new case in their hospital, we will review it uh, and decide on the best treatment. And we also talk to everyone about follow-up of, of these patients. Uh, and we have, because we're all listening and learning about this particular syndrome, developed some expertise. And if you think sitting here today at the end of April, that we've only known about it for six weeks. We have actually managed to produce guidance and patient leaflets, and we are coordinating care with all of the other groups of uh, medical staff that are involved. So it's been absolutely full on. So what is VITS? So vaccine-induced immune thrombocytopenia, which means low platelets and thrombosis. Uh, and patients are presenting with thrombosis in very unusual sites. So we're not usually talking about deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. We're talking for about 50% of the cases, people presenting with a really, really bad headache and having um, a thrombosis in the very large vein in the brain, which is called the cerebral venous sinus. And so uh, that can give an awful headache and people feel really unwell. Now these clots have been happening after day five, after the vaccine. So lots of people have the vaccine and they don't feel good. They might have a bit of temperature and fluey symptoms and headache, but that tends to settle down. And this is presenting really from day five. So we have seen these clots in the brain and also clots in the tummy, uh, blood clots in the veins, such as the portal vein or the splenic vein. Um, and also some people have had problems with blood flow to their legs, 
or heart problems because they've had clots in their arteries. And occasionally people have had deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary emboli. Now this is very different from a standard clot. And this is not normal way clots form. Clots form normally in the legs because you, people sit around for too long and they've got slightly sticky blood and then something else happens. Uh, and they have a clot. This is happening as an immune response, an incredibly rare immune response to the vaccine. Is this type of blood clot with low platelet counts seen in any other vaccine that's so far been delivered? So we have seen it with the J&J vaccine in the States. And what both of the um, syndromes that we see after J&J and AstraZeneca have is that everybody has developed an antibody to a molecule called platelet factor four. Uh, and this is something that we see very rarely in people who are on long-term heparin in critical care units. We're always on the lookout for it. And so that's rather unusual uh, so it's an immune response to the vaccine that looks like this heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. So the names are obviously very similar. But we haven't seen this with other vaccines. And have you seen, you mentioned the heparin-linked uh, thrombosis and low platelet count. Have you seen this syndrome anywhere else before? Or is it really quite new? It's totally new. So we, we knew that this heparin-induced thrombosis and thrombocytopenia could occur spontaneously very, very rarely. I mean, one in a million, one in 10 million, um, and it's behaving like that. So we aren't treating these clots in the normal way. We are giving people therapy to try and stop the immune response and to block the effect of the antibody. And then the, the other thing is that we're worried about, it looks like heparin induced thrombocytopenia and we wouldn't give any more heparin in that setting. So we try not to use heparin in these patients. Although at the beginning, some of them got heparin and, and they were fine, but we, for the moment, we're just using non heparin anticoagulants. But from what you're saying, Anybody with a sticky blood or thrombosis, thrombophilia history or, or diagnosis, if they are older than 30 and have had their vaccine so far, are they at any increased risk of developing VIT than any other person? No, they're not. We don't understand why. Most of these people are totally healthy. They are have, we don't have anyone with underlying sticky blood. I don't have anyone with antiphospholipid syndrome, antithrombin deficiency. They may, a few of them may have factor five Leiden and not know it, but there are, none of these things are risk factors for having these clots. And they're affecting men and women and all ages. So we, we don't know what the risk factors are. And uh, if somebody does have a sticky blood problem or previous clot, um, it doesn't mean that they're at increased risk of getting this particular problem. Thank you. If somebody develops symptoms and you say from about the fifth day, what are the symptoms that they should look out for and what should they do? So half of them have got this cerebral sinus thrombosis so they have a really really awful headache and they might have some stroke like symptoms they need to seek medical care as soon as possible what is the great thing about the current situation is that everybody's aware of this because the mhra did do a big press release so the public are aware they're presenting to the emergency departments and all the doctors are aware and they know about our guidance. So we've got living guidance, which they can download 
uh, whenever they need it on the British Society for Haematology website. It's just freely available and we're, it's living guidance. So as we learn more, we're, we're updating the best way to manage these patients. And I think we're doing really, really well uh, in, well, if you consider we're six weeks in, in that um, at the start, the Europeans described this and they described lots of people dying, about 50% mortality, uh, and our mortality is less than 20%. So it's patients presenting early and then getting the best possible care uh, that we know about at this current time. Uh, and I think that's fairly reassuring. Um, and also it is it is very, very rare. At the end, of, we don't quite know what the true instance is, but it is incredibly rare. If somebody has had a low platelet uh, condition before or has suffered from an heparin-induced low platelet issue, should they avoid the AstraZeneca vaccine? So the only uh, real contraindication is having had heparin-induced thrombocytopenia hit before. Uh, or, or if they've had VITs before, uh, then obviously we wouldn't give them uh, the second dose. But uh, I am aware of a few patients who have had the AstraZeneca vaccine, who have had HIT, and they're fine. They're actually my patients, and they are absolutely fine. And this happened before we knew about this syndrome. So everyone's trying to be cautious, but I, I don't think that uh, it's too much of an issue, but we, of course we must be cautious in this setting. And in general, with the vaccines, has there been an increased risk of developing blood clots without the low platelet after having one of the COVID vaccines? So when we look at all the clots that we uh, are seeing, uh, they're no greater than the background risk of clots. Um, and, and, you know, people do spontaneously have clots from day to day or, or they appear spontaneously, but afterwards we find why they have them. So, no, not really greater than the background rate. What is the guidance for them to, to follow then on their future vaccines? Well, I, I think that you're first. The first thing to say is we wouldn't give them AstraZeneca vaccine again. Uh, but the second thing to say is we've only known about this for six weeks and we don't quite know how things will progress. So anybody who has had this and has been discharged from hospital is being watched like a hawk and they should be having regular blood tests and be in contact with a local hematologist so that they get good care and we can learn and understand what the natural history of this problem is. And when it's diagnosed early, so people recognise the symptoms, they report it, they go and seek medical advice quickly and it's diagnosed, what is, is it very treatable? I and mean, do people tend to recover well from this? So we've got quite a lot of people who've been discharged. They get um, the immune therapy and then they go on anticoagulation. If the platelet count comes up, they'll go back home on one of the new blood thinners such as rivaroxaban, apixaban, idoxaban, dabigatran, um, and then they'll be followed up, uh, but obviously at home. And on the whole, certainly in the UK, the majority of patients have survived and are recovering well. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. We've heard from some patients um, asking would it be valuable for them to take something like aspirin before or after receiving um, a COVID vaccine? What is the clinical advice on this? Well, it's not going to make any difference at all as to whether or not they get VITS. Their chances of getting VITS teeny weeny and taking aspirin or a blood thinner will make no difference to that because this is an immune response and the anticoagulant or aspirin won't affect that and really you shouldn't be taking aspirin if you're healthy and well because if you take aspirin and you're healthy and well okay it will slightly reduce your risk of further thrombosis but it also increases your risk of bleeding uh, and it increases your risk of bleeding more than uh, reducing your risk of thrombosis the answer is please do not take aspirin regularly uh, and taking anticoagulants, similarly, you've got a risk of, of bleeding too. So if you don't need it, you shouldn't take it. 
just as blood clots can affect anybody of any age, any gender, is it clear yet, or, or is it across all age groups, um, those who have been affected by the vaccine-induced thrombosis and thrombocytopenia, is there any age or any indication that one is more at risk than another? Nope. So uh, looking, at, it's affected all the different ages that have been vaccinated. Um, it may be slightly more common in the younger ones, but that's probably because we uh, didn't look hard enough uh, at the older ones when they had the vaccine early on. You remember in the UK, we started off with the really old and those in care homes and we came down. Uh, if you talk to the Europeans, uh, they will say, oh, well, it only affects young women. Well, that's because when they started out their vaccination, they vaccinated people who are healthcare workers first, and the average healthcare worker is a young woman. So I think that that's just reflecting the population that they vaccinated. If somebody is anticoagulated, I'm not sure if there's been a case of this or not, at the time of the vaccination, and does develop it, would they present in any different way, perhaps bruising or bleeding more, or do we not know yet? Uh, I suppose they might present a little bit earlier because with a low platelet count, they might have more marked uh, bruising, but I'm not aware of any of the patients being on anticoagulation. Uh, and most of the people who get this problem are quite healthy. So, well, they were previously healthy, so I, it's not really re very relevant, I think, at the moment. So being proactive, um, obviously, if somebody has had a vaccination, but after the three or four days of when we might take normal side effects, they continue with perhaps a severe headache or excessive breathlessness for them or pains in certain parts of their body, which they can't explain. What should they do yeah. if they experience this? They need to seek um, a health professional. So we have worked with the Royal College of General Practitioners. They have guidance. We have worked with emergency medicine. Uh, and so all emergency departments have guidance. In fact, many people, after uh, there was the press release from the MHRA, were going to emergency departments with bad headaches after AstraZeneca vaccine and uh, I worked with uh, Dr. Sue Pavard, who's the chair of the expert hematology panel with emergency medicine. And we came up with some very quick guidance on how we could triage these patients because there were so many that they were affecting flows uh, in the emergency departments. If you did have a very bad headache after day five, after AstraZeneca, you'd go to the emergency department and before you know it, you'd be having um, a platelet count just to check that you didn't have fits. So you mentioned earlier, and, and I think this is really reassuring, that there is constant monitoring of data after every vaccination and certainly of people who have been diagnosed with fit. What does this go on to inform to reassure patients? So we do have a wonderful regulator called the MHRA in the UK, and they are watching what is happening like a hawk. Um, and so we have most of the cases, we see them, we discuss them. They too have the same data. They are following all the cases uh, and they are letting the Joint Committee for Vaccination know about the rates of the, vac of, of the problem. The role of the haematologist, someone like me, at the front line looking after these patients is to make sure these patients get diagnosed as quickly as possible and they get the very best care. Those with a history of thrombosis or a diagnosis of a, um, a thrombophilia are not at any increased risk of the vaccine or it at all. Thank you. And then finally, we know about the living guidance. In fact, um, I know we've also shared on the Thrombosis UK website for patients. What information is available for patients? Yes. So we've got a patient information sheet as well. That too is on the Thrombosis UK website. Uh, and as things change, that too will be updated. Thank you, Beverly, so much for your time. I appreciate you're extremely busy and 
the past 14, 15 months have been unrelenting, haven't they? But thank you so very much. Thank you.